So quite a few people have been messaging under my videos, why do your plants look so lush and green all the time and how do you keep them alive? Well, first of all, before we get into like the full details of it all, I want to assure you that my plants don't look absolutely amazing all the time. I'd say sometimes they look decent, half good. Normally at the new stages of the setup, you get your initial diatoms, you'll get certain plants dying off while everything's trying to settle in. So don't be fooled into thinking that everything is perfect. So for instance, this is my rainbow fish tank and on the surface look, oh, it looks fantastic. Everything's great. Certain plants are growing really well. The hydrocortical Japan, growing great. All sort of fresh new growth on it. But look at the bulbitis. There's all sorts of thread algae and things like that on there. Hello, sorry. <laughs> Not at the moment, guys. We're just looking at the bulbitis. It's, oh, for crying. You are beautiful though. Okay, all right. You can have two seconds. One, two. Well, back to you in a minute. The bulbitis has got lots of uh, fred algae on it. The limb, the feeler at the back there looks lush, but the tips of them have got a little bit of cyanobacteria. Now, I'm not completely sure why this happens, but it is quite common. Um, again, once the tank sort of gets mature, it doesn't happen as much, but when they're really close to light, you can get that. Anyway, my point is that sometimes everything isn't perfect, especially in new setups, but they can get perfect. It's all normally dependent on the lighting that you've got for your tank. Now, the correct lighting does not necessarily mean really expensive. It doesn't necessarily mean cheap either. Correct is just the sort of amount or the sort of luminosity of the light and whether it's good enough to grow the plants or not. If it's good enough, you'll get growth. If it isn't good enough, you won't, obviously. The problem is, though, is that when you don't get decent growth out of your plants, you start running into algae issues because that seems to be able to grow a lot easier than the plants. So you're like, oh, my plants aren't growing well, I must need more fertilizer. So you put fertilizer into the water column with a low light, and then the algae starts to use that fertilizer, and then the algae grows, but the plants don't. So this tank right here is a really good example of what I'm talking about. When I set this up, was, oh, what was it, like a week and a half, nearly two weeks ago now, I had the light, um, you, can sw you can flip this around, so there's a short piece there. If you flip them around, obviously it comes much lower. I had it too low, it's a no filter setup. I've got quite a bit of algae on the rocks, and I noticed there's quite a bit of algae as well up there. Look, it's just not balanced enough for that amount of light at the moment. I think I'll be able to lower it eventually. Point being though, the, the light intensity was causing problems. Now the plants were growing, and they are growing, sorry, because I mean, this is this pearl weed is already like doubled in size. It's gonna have its first trim back soon. But it's just, ever there's too much light. If you're getting algae just constantly, then you need to wind it back a bit, and that's what I've done. Now, these two tanks here are actually a really good example, to be honest, of what I'm talking about. Both the lights are very budget, one of the cheapest ones I could find. They get a good sort of, a good, uh, bang for your buck really if you wanted high-end lighting you'd probably need two of those together both sat about that high off the tank but because i don't run co2 and i just have tiny little internal filters um, this kind of lighting works with a low budget setup and you can see i've got this raised up at the same height as that one but you can also see how good all the growth is so it just goes to show like you can think you need to blast the tank with lots of light but it's not necessary all the time. Now, it depends on the plants, of course. So for instance, here we've got lots of crypts, which don't require a lot of light. But we have got Blixa japonica, and at the bottom there's S. repens. They require a medium amount of light, so they're still getting what they need, even though the light is right up high and isn't crazy powerful either. Now, because it's not crazy powerful, we don't get tons of algae, the plants grow well, I wouldn't say super fast and in the best of conditions. I mean, some of them have got some clear deficiencies going on, but overall, I think given the fact that it's a really low budget and uh, sort of low tech setup, it's, it's, it's nice, isn't it? I, I think most people would enjoy this sort of thing in their living room or something like that with, without it costing a bomb. So yeah, those are like cheap strip lights. You can get them on Amazon. I'll leave a link in the description. I've got the bigger version here on this tank suspended with some, uh, some fishing wire actually, a little bit closer. There's two of them as well. And that's purely because it's a really deep tank. I wanted to make sure that we're getting light everywhere. And we've got enough light, you see, because down at the bottom, the crypts are growing well, the S repens are growing well, and that's a good sign. There's no algae in the tank as well. When I say no algae, remember, I mean minimal algae, stuff you can't really see. So strip lights are fantastic. Very easy just to buy sick on. Some of you might want to go ultra low tech though and do your own DIY lighting. So this right here is my Amazon Aquarium. I think there's, there's no denying that uh, the plants are growing fantastically well. But what is causing all that growth? Well, there's a few things. Obviously, there's quite a, a bit of waste produced by these fish in here, which means there's constant fertilizers. But on top of that, we have got floodlights. These are like floodlights you would stick like on your driveway to light it. They are 6,500 Kelvin, so sunlight, like in midday sunlight. And all I've done is just hooked them up 
to a piece of wood that I've just bracketed and stuck to the frame at the bottom there so that it runs all the way at the top. They're 30 watts each and yeah, I think the results speak for themselves. This Hydrocottle Japan is going crazy, but what's really good about these lights as well is that the reds are also really good. So look at that at the back there. Come out of the way, fishies. I'll get to you in a minute. Ludwigia Palustra Super Red is super red, but the fish as well, the colors on the fish is so vibrant. And that again is because that's 6,500 Kelvin, I think it's the absolute best um, sort of uh, temperature for any of the lights, to be honest. Look, look at how good all the colors on the fish are. So good. I have to say that the floodlight method is my favorite method of lighting the tank. So a lot of you are gonna ask this one, how long should I keep my lights on for? I keep most of my lights, actually all of these lights on for 12 hours. <gasps> 12 hours? I mean, yeah, that sounds like a lot. Remember, they're all low wattage, so it's not like I'm, it's not, they don't cost, they do cost a lot, because there's a lot of them, but individually they don't cost a lot. Um, so like, you're not gonna have as many tanks as me, are you? So yeah, 12 hours for me. Now what's good about that is I can actually ramp it back if I need to, I, I never do that because I, I pretty much got it nailed now where I know that that's the right amount of light and I can adjust other variables. It might not be the same for you though. One of the easiest things to probably do if you're getting lots of algae is to just nail it back by a few hours each time or an hour each time and just keep coming back until it starts to sort of die off or at least balances out. But I'm in my studio for a long time and I like having all the lights on. I can be here for 12 hours sometimes. I mean, it might be like a split shift or something because I go home and have some lunch, but uh, I like the lights to be on when I'm here and I get here early. So that's why I do 12 hours and I don't really change that. But if you're at home and you're going to work, you could do like, apparently you could do lighting schedules where you do like say four hours in the morning. So you're, when you're awake, you can see it all. And then four hours after work as well. So you're getting a total of eight hours. Apparently this can trigger like, like to think it's been two days, you get even more growth. I've never actually experimented that, so it might be interesting. But yeah, I use 12 hours of lighting. You might not necessarily need to do that or want to do that, so you don't have to, but that's what I do. And remember, I'm using low watt, not high powered lighting, so that's probably why I can get away with those extended periods. If you're using like the top tech lights that just blast light down, I think they do like six to eight hours. Most, most places I know do that. Now, whatever lighting you do choose, and you can choose any lighting, you have to expect the results equivalent to the cost really there's no doubt about it the expensive lights are amazing they just ugh, the, the coloring and everything is great i just choose not to go for that style i kind of enjoy the challenge of going for like the most budget i can but with that i do lower my expectations so i'm not expecting my tank to look like these high-end ada you know like full co2 systems they're just not going to look like that <laughs> they'll still look good just just not like that and that leads me nicely on to the next chapter plant I suppose a more appropriate title for this section would be plant selection because obviously you've got to have plants to keep plants alive. <laughs> but plant selection, I would say that's key and it depends on the setup, the lighting levels. For instance, if you've got like a really, really budget light that isn't hitting the depth of the tank, you don't want to go put in like a glossostigma and hair grass carpet because nothing will happen. It'll probably just melt away, to be honest. I have had incidents where that isn't true. I've had it where the grass just stayed exactly the same for like six months. <laughs> Which is still quite good, I suppose, because you get that look, but you, you won't get it growing in. So you've got to think about the type of setup you've got and what you think plant-wise is going to be appropriate. Now, there's certain plants that just grow easy in any light, and that's like Limnophila, Limnophila sessiliflora. <laughs> this thing is like a weed, and you can cut it so quickly, replant it, cut, replant it, really easy to do because the, the nodes, as in the distance between each part of the plant, is like quite wide so you can just like trim and replant and when you do that obviously you get more and it gets thicker and bushier so you can get that really sort of dense look with it even in a really low tech setup it does take some time and a lot of trimming and replanting but you can get it another one i find is dwarf sag i found that it grows in no matter what tank i put it in and what lighting levels as well so dwarf sag again really vibrant green ones one of the things i make sure that i do when i pick my plants is I always go for the ones that I've used before that I know work well. I've got quite a broad range of the ones I can use now, so I can get that like sort of variating look, not massively, but yeah, quite a variation of looks um, across the board. Ludwigias, I find, do grow well in any lighting. It's just that they'll go way more red in a higher lighting setup. So with the floodlights in the tank behind me, the reds on all the Ludwigias are proper red. But if we had less of a light, it'd be more like a brownie sort of yellow. So again, you can get them all to grow great. Just, um, you've got to be realistic in your expectation of what you think it's going to be versus what it's actually going to be. 
If you find that your like reds or plants that are supposed to be reds aren't properly red, it will literally just be that the lighting isn't high enough. So you can either upgrade the light, bring the light closer down. And sometimes when those plants actually grow further to the surface and they're right under the light, they can really, really get vibrant at that period. But you know, sometimes we want that a bit further down the tank, don't we? Otherwise you're left with like not a lot going on at the bottom and then all the color at the top can look good, can work as well. It just depends on the setup. If you've got like a proper traditional style aquascape with you know a, a retaining wall of rocks, a load of wood coming up, and then you want all the stems and color behind that, don't you? So that can work really well there if you bank the substrate up. So you have got options. If I had to do all this all again, um, some good advice I'd give to you would be go to the shop and pick like five different plants, stem plants in pots. So you've actually got a little bit of growth to them already. I'm talking like the easy plants. Hygrophila polysperma, Siamensis 53b, Limnophila siciliflora, like those kind of ones. Um, put them all in your tank, yeah? They should grow. I mean, you don't even have to plant them. They just put them in the pots. They should just keep growing. Work out which ones are your favorite. Work out which ones are actually doing well in your water parameters. To be honest, all of those should do well. You know, pick some other rotala of Tundafolia and some, uh, I don't know, dwarf sage, stuff like that as well. Get them in that sand, get them in that base layer. Uh, we'll talk about nutrients in a minute, that's the next stage. Um, but first of all, you've got to pick some plants, haven't you? So yeah, go out, pick those plants. Straight away, you're gonna get some good growth, gonna give you some confidence. In my opinion, floating plants are absolutely essential to a low-tech system. Every single one of my tanks has got some kind of floating plants in, whether that's red root floaters, salvinia, water lettuce, duckweed, and frogbit, Amazon frogbit, I've got that as well. So I've got five different types dotted around at any one time. There isn't a specific one for a specific tank, I just like to sort of collect them and grow them, move them across. When I do a new setup, I'll choose some to go in that as well. But the reason they're so good is that they use CO2 from the atmosphere to grow and they pull nutrients from the water column so that means they're like turbocharged filters if you like sucking up all of those nutrients from the water column that would cause algae and just converting it to growth the way you export that waste then because the waste is what's caused them to grow is just taking them out like it's like you've got an infinite supply of them technically once you get them growing because the fish are creating the poop the poop's going in the water column the plants are all growing the plants inside the tank are growing you're trimming you're taking them out and it just keeps going and keeps going floating plants are also really good at bringing down some lighting levels um, if you're finding that your tanks are a little bit too bright. I've had it before, I've added the floating plants only to a tank and all the algae's just gone within a couple of weeks. Uh, there's no nutrients for it and there's less light for it, so that's why that's working. Also, they just give a massively natural look, don't they, to the whole tank. Like, especially when you view them from, um, if you come down low in your tank and look upwards, you get that sort of labyrinth of roots coming down, the fish love swimming out of them, they feel like they've got cover as well, so you'll see better behavior. You'll find with fish, the more cover you give them, the more out in the open they tend to come, most fish anyway. <laughs> so yeah, if you haven't got any floating plants, I suggest you get some. You can buy them on eBay, you can go to your local fish shop, find one that works really well in your water parameters and stick with it, and then maybe introduce some other ones as you go along. But as soon as you can, find a floating plant that works for you. To be honest, this isn't the easiest of subjects because it can be really confusing. So I've had tanks where I put nothing but gravel in and plants and the plants have done well. Had good stocking levels of fish, which means the fish produced waste that went down into the gravel system and provided nutrients for those roots. This is why I get so many people asking me, oh, how do you keep um, the stones separated when you gravel vac? I have never gravel vac a tank ever. Like I think I did it once and I was like, this is a waste of time and just didn't do it again. <laughs> Obviously that's very different if you haven't got a full planted tank and if you've got like, I don't know, Malawi cichlids or something that, yeah, you have to do it then. But for planted tanks, you're actually taking nutrients out that could be used for the benefit of the whole ecosystem. So yeah, you can keep it completely simple and just go with gravel, but just don't expect explosive growth from the get-go. It's gonna take time for the nutrient levels in that whole tank to build up. It can take about a month, to be honest, before you see really lush growth. However, if you wanna do it another way, you can. So quite often I use um, little media bags that I put aqua soil into. Aqua soil is just a nutrient rich sort of balls of soil that just hard to, and they stick together. Um, so you can put those as the base layer and then cap it off with sand if you want, or you can just pour it in and then just plant straight into that. It, it can be done in several ways. I just like capping it so it doesn't go everywhere. <laughs> you can also just get gravel or sand and put root tabs in. Again, you're, all you're doing then is adding those nutrients to the sand or gravel straight away. Effectively like waiting for the poop to get in there in that method, but you're just speeding everything up. It's just way quicker and the plants can actually start rooting within the first week or so. That's the key really. 
really. As soon as you get those plants rooting, they're just gonna take off. Even ones that can feed from the water column, if you get the roots going as well, they just, yeah, it just goes crazy then. And that's even without CO2 I've found. Quite a few of my tanks are just so overgrown because they grow so fast. Um, I've got a lot of tanks, so it's hard to keep up, but I do enjoy the overgrown look, I'm not gonna lie. But to be honest, what I've found the absolute best method is that aqua soil in the media bags capped off with sand. I've got loads of tanks around me now that have just done those methods that I've had amazing success with. Some of them, one of them in fact, was the ecosystem tank that I had running for over a year with that method and it was still flourishing. The only reason I broke it down is because I wanted to get some different fish and change it up a bit. But uh, that was working so well for so long and all my other tanks here are doing great as well with that method. So that's what I would suggest. You don't have to put the uh, axle in the media bag. You can just put it as a bottom layer and then cap it off if you want. The reason I'm saying cap it off is it just seems to keep all the nutrients locked down tight um, with these low tech tanks and it stops so much organics floating in the in the water column because most people are not up for doing like weekly or every other week or whatever water changes so the, the method I set up means that you don't have to do that many water changes as well well how and you do initially um, but after the tank settles in in about a month it's, it's just it's just autopilot and you sit back and enjoy so everyone has their own preferences and opinions on filtration I'm not one of those guys like whatever you think and whatever you like to use is going to work so I've got some tanks with zero filtration apart from the plants floating plants and I've got some that have got lots of filtration actually, two canisters on one of my tanks. And But the majority of my tanks, I just use a little internal and that's mainly just to push the water around. It's got a little bit of sponge uh, for mechanical filtration, just to polish the water a little bit every now and again. Most of the time that clogs up and I turn it off though and forget to turn it back on again. <laughs> like this one behind me now, I've only just switched it back on um, after cleaning out the sponges because otherwise you'd have some yeah, it's not nice. Um, and it's absolutely fine. Like, it's been off for like two weeks completely. So I just thought I'd just polish the water a little bit with it because it's at such a mature stage now that all the filtration's happening in this substrate system and also the plants. They've just got a perfect balance. And this is why I say it doesn't really matter if you set the tank up right now. This is not for non-planted tanks, by the way. If you've got like a cichlid tank, of hundreds of them all in there, blah, 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 then you need serious filtration. <laughs> but for my planted tanks, I, I can use anything. I've got hang on the backs as well. I've got a sponge filter. No, I don't anymore. I used to have some sponge filters, but I just opt for a little tiny internal one now. I like the internal ones because they make an annoying clicking noise, which tells me that it needs cleaning out. <laughs> Again, once the tank gets mature, I just basically switch them off unless like they are needed. For instance, in my Rainbow River Aquarium, uh, they like the fast flow, so I keep that going all the time and they're just swimming in and out of it which is awesome but yeah go with whatever you want like you don't need masses of filtration i don't think for the style of tanks that i've got anyway so the low tech style of tanks like i said we've got a nice big substrate system and that's providing all of the sort of uh, home for the beneficial bacteria that you'd normally have in the canister um, but it's just in the tank so it's kind of the same thing something just to push a little bit of water around definitely to start with i'll always go with something to push the water around unless you're doing a specific no filter tank like i've got much much harder to do though way harder to do a tank with no filter than there is with even just a little filter in there but it's more than doable if you're willing to you know take your time with it and put the care and attention into it that it needs so filter get whatever one you want <laughs> here's actually a perfect example of what i was just talking about so you can see that this is so lush and it looks perfect there's very 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 minimal algae in this tank and if you come and look at the filter that we've got we've just got one of these little internal ones with a spray bar and i've come up here look and you can see the spray bar is barely even working but it's just enough to keep water flowing through so the uh, beneficial bacteria in the sponge in there will be doing well but at this point it's not even needed because we've got a thick um, aqua soil layer that goes at the front that depth it's much much higher at the back there with gravel underneath as well so we've got all the beneficial bacteria we need the tank's just on autopilot and that's what i love about planted tanks they just they do their own thing you just sort of got to coax it in the right direction so fertilizers it's going to be very much tank dependent so i go for low tech setups which means i don't want a mass of excess nutrients in the tank and i already put a good amount of fish in most of my uh, setups so the fish are providing the majority of the uh, fertilizer that the plants need from their poop but every time i do a water change or a water top up 
Water changes happen quite a lot in the early stages of the tank. Later on, it's just evaporation, top up, evaporation, top up. Every time I do a top up, which is usually probably twice a week in the summertime, once a week in the wintertime, uh, because everything's air conned, but you still, yeah, you still get evaporation. People wonder about that quite a, little, a lot in my um, studio, actually, but uh, it's pretty good. The, all the air gets pulled out, so I don't get mold and things. So yeah, I like to use a fertilizer once a week, and the one that I use is, hang on, yeah, this isn't sponsored or anything, but I use API Leaf Zone. It's iron and potassium, and that's about it really, because like I say, I'm getting the rest of the nutrients from the fish's poop. And if I start adding in like a special sort of all-in-one or estimated index fertilizer into the tank, before you know it, it's just gonna be over, over flooded with algae. Over flooded, overgrown, over, yeah, there's gonna be a lot of algae. <laughs> so I guess what I'm saying is I keep everything on the proper lean side. I let the fish provide the nutrients and then top it up with some iron and potassium, um, just a simple fertilizer and it works really well for me. If you're going for a high-end setup, which I'm assuming you're not really, if you're watching this video, because it's not really aimed at that, is it? If you're going for a high-end setup, loads of CO2, then you need to be putting loads of different fertilizers. They like do daily fertilizers, weekly water, Water changes. Uh, that's not my style of fish keeping or aquascaping, but you know I understand that it's it's a requirement in in that sort of setup. So yeah, literally for a tank this size here, I don't know why I was struggling to undo a lid. <laughs> I just do one capful. There we go, just like that for this size. Um, I'll probably do this the last little bit. I've used the whole bottle. Uh oh, I need some more. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll use a capful for this one. I'll use half a cap for the smaller smaller tanks and obviously even smaller tanks, even less than that. But I found that that is just the right amount and it just keeps everything looking lush, but minimal algae. I say minimal, there's always some. Right, I'm, I'm not gonna sit here and pretend to know anything about CO2. I've used it a couple of times in the last four and a half years since I've been keeping fish and making fish tanks, and I know that it is amazing stuff. Uh, but for someone who doesn't want to keep continuously trimming plants, i.e. me, it's an absolute no-no in my studio. That's why I like to keep everything low tech. But you might want to use CO2, and in fact, you might need to. Apparently, if you've got a high pH, you need the CO2 to bring it down to like the level, um, not the level where I'm at, but even lower actually, because mine's, my, my CO2 levels in my tap are of decent amount I'm a, and I'm at a pH of seven. So it's right, right neutral. If you're up in the high eights, apparently it can be harder, but nothing like impossible to actually, you know, grow decent plants. And again, I, even then, I don't think you have to have CO2. You just have to select specific plants. I'm not gonna babble on about this because I don't wanna to pretend to be an expert, but if you are interested in those crazy ADA and green aqua, George Farmer style um, aquascapes, they all use CO2. Yuri's as well, he's another one. He, he always uses CO2. And a lot of the top aquascapers, they just all use CO2. Uh, it's a great thing. It's uh, apparently once you've got the initial investment, it's not that expensive, expensive to like maintain it. You just gotta keep you know, dosing that bottle, which doesn't cost a huge amount either, I don't think. It's just the initial investment. That said, I know that if I put it on one of the tanks in here, I'm gonna want it on all of them, so I just don't bother at all. But yeah, if you're interested in CO2, there's tons of people with guides on and loads of information on that. Um, you have to look elsewhere for that though, because my knowledge is, is not great. <laughs> No, I'm not talking about the thing that Santa puts presents in. I'm talking about the amount of fish in your aquarium. Now, when you get started with the tank, start low. Just start low stocking. I mean, I put fish in my tanks straight away from the get-go, which is called a fish in cycle. We can talk about that in a bit, actually, because that's quite important as well in terms of starting a tank, I think. So most tanks, I start about five or six fish. That's it. If it's a smaller tank, it's smaller fish. If it's the four foot tanks, it's normally bigger fish, you know, like electric blue car, as I'm, I'm looking at them right behind me. Um, and then in smaller tanks like this one here is rice fish. So, you know, it's all relative to the size of the tank. The problem is if you start putting in too many fish initially, you get way too much ammonia for the pl new plants you put in for the, what they can handle. It can actually either burn them off and melt them or it can sort of cause the fish death, which means even more ammonia, and it's just like a vicious cycle. So fish in cycling is one of those things that I've heard get a bit of a 
a few bad comments towards it, you know? I'm guessing this is said by people that haven't tried it or seen like the great results you can have with fish in cycling. So what do we mean by fish in cycling? What it means is like the tank is new, there's new water, there's a new filter in it, and you're able to put fish in straight away. We do this by adding beneficial bacteria to the tank, but also closely monitoring the water every single day and looking for any signs of ammonia spikes, nitrite spikes, that kind of thing. And then um, you could just drain the water out and refill it again, and then it's all fresh. The idea is then that everything's getting colonized by bacteria because the fish are providing waste to it, the correct amount of waste for those fish. The more traditional style would be to add your own ammonia to the tank before any fish go in, you build up the bacteria levels. Now, the problem with that is, is how much ammonia, you know, I'm sure there are formulas to work it out, but like you put your fish in, maybe you get some bacteria die off and then you get like a recycle going on and you're back to square one. I've talked with quite a few people about this, really knowledgeable people as well have combined like time of like 40 years worth of fish keeping experience. And even they say, start with a few fish in your tank and just let it cycle itself and monitor the water. To do that, you do need a test kit. So you need to, you should have one of those anyway, to be fair, shouldn't you? So that's not too much of an issue. And we're just looking for little, little spikes of ammonia not big ones where it's dangerous like it's not going to hurt the fish but you can see that there's signs of ammonia in the water get that water down and up again to be honest i just do 50 percent more changes when i'm doing this every single day anyway for at least a week or so um, every tank's different most of them balance out between a week week and a half to two weeks at this point you can start adding a few more fish in and getting up to numbers that you actually want in the tank so if you start off with like I don't know, four, five, six, and then eventually you go up, like add a two more and add two more, something like that. Now I know the tendency is just to just put in all the fish you want straight away, um, but it is possible. Um, you, you need to pay so much attention to it though, that it doesn't give any room for error at all. Like I have done it before and I've done it very well. In fact, I did it with this tank behind me, which was really, really heavily stocked. Um, it worked well, I really closely monitored it, but I needed to do that because I already had the fish, so I had to put them back into the tank. Um, luckily we had some other media as well dotted about that, I put some sponges in. Uh, but my, most of my big tanks only have a little sponge, they haven't got a big canister full of media, so it was kind of pretty much starting again from scratch, uh, bacteria wise, considering the amount of fish that were in the tank. And I'm sure you'll agree, it's all worked out pretty darn well in this tank. Ultra spotted the albino pleco down there. Can we get a better view? You're a beast, aren't you? Look at him. Oh, no, her, that's a her. There's no bristles, but yeah. So why is fish in cycling relevant to keeping your plants alive? Well, I just find that a balance is created a lot faster. When there's a faster balance, it means you get less algae and more plants growing. If plants are growing fast, you're away, aren't you? It can outcompete the algae and everything is good. So for me, fish in cycling after one and a half to two weeks, you're right there. And in that period, you're changing water so regularly, there's no algae either. For me, every tank needs some form of cleanup crew. Whether that's just snails, bristle nose, something like that, it still needs something. Eventually, there's going to be some sort of imbalance and algae will form, or it's just a constant, really low background level. Now, sometimes in some of my big tanks, I'll just have one bristle nose pleco and that does the, does the job everywhere. And in another tank, maybe I've got a little bit more powerful lighting, I'll put two or three in and that does the job. Again, this, this is one of those ones where you don't really put the cleanup crew in straight away because you don't know what you'll need and you, you wanna make sure there's enough food for them, food in the form of algae, of course. So usually around the two week mark after setting a tank up is when I add the cleanup crew and I tend to go for um, Otto Sinclis, Amano Shrimp, and ram's horn snails. Every now and again, I'll get a neurite snail as well. But what I like about the ram's horn snails is they breed fast and you get a good population for the tank. If you don't overfeed the tank, the population will stabilize and be just enough. That's why my tanks aren't just covered in snails everywhere. <laughs> now the thing is, with a mano shrimp, it can be a little bit difficult because if you've got bigger fish, they're just gonna eat them up. For instance, I put them once, quite a few of them, in my discus tank. I haven't got my discus tank now, but I used to. Oh no, my light's gone off, hang on. I'm fix that, there we go. Yeah, I, uh, I think I put about 10 or 20 even Amano shrimp in my discus tank and they ate them all like within a day. So not always appropriate, but in that tank, bristlenose plecos worked brilliantly along with the snails, which they left alone as well. If you're getting some really bad hair algae, you can use some products to, to sort that out. But if you don't want to, you can use Siamese algae eaters. I've used this a lot before to great effect. Also, you can just do a lot of this stuff manually as well. It's always best if you can see stuff, just take it out of your hands and then let the critters do the work on the smaller stuff. You know, the stuff that's really sort of, I don't know, 
etched onto things, you know, it's like solid. You can't even get off sometimes with a brush as well. I found that Amano shrimp are really good with a more sort of powdery type of algae. Bristle nose plecos are absolutely brilliant for diatoms and that sort of early phase. Snails are good just overall everywhere. But go with that after two weeks for setup, look for Amano shrimp, snails, and bristle nose plecos. If you've got a smaller tank, bristle nose isn't really gonna be good. So it's just the snails and the Amano shrimp. Assuming you've got a small tank, you've got small fish, and the shrimp will be good with that. Again, why do we need to worry about cleanup crew? What's that got to do with keeping plants alive? It's all about the plants competing with the algae for light and nutrients. We get rid of the algae, all the light and nutrients are available for the plants. If you keep it at a low level of algae, because remember there's always some in there, then the plants can just absolutely flourish. Remember, the more light and nutrients you can give the tank without an algae explosion, the better the plants are gonna grow. So having a cleanup crew is really gonna contribute towards this, but you know, there's going to be times when it doesn't completely fix it. You're going to be completely baffled as to what to do. You feel like you've got the lights right because the plants are growing pretty decently. It's just this annoying level of, of algae that's not taking over the tank, but you don't want it there. Now, of course, manual removal is always the first option. Get as much as you can. Sometimes I like to use brushes and things like this. So you can get into tight spots with that one and this one, you just twirl it around like thread algae. And not only does it take off what you can see, it pulls it all the way from inside of the plants and things like that as well. So you just get a twirl and it looks like green candy floss on a stick. Um, but then after you've done that, you might want to treat the tank with a chemical as well. Now chemicals probably should be your last resort really. That's what I look to last because you can fix the problem with a chemical, but it's going to come straight back if you haven't sorted the other areas. So this is for like annoying levels that won't go away, but not complete like coverage of algae. If there's coverage, your light is probably just way too strong. Now when you've got some leaves that have got some horrible bits of algae on them, I use uh, API CO2 booster. This is a glutaraldehyde. It's marketed as liquid carbon. They all are marketed as liquid carbon, but realistically, let's face it, it's going to stop algae on onto leaves, which means the leaves can take on more CO2 that's in the water. All water has a certain level of CO2. So if you're going to have algae on those leaves, then it's going to struggle to pull it all in. So if you use this stuff, you can spot treat it as well with like um, a syringe or something like that, or you can just dose the water column. I tend to spot treat big areas that are like not very good at all. And then after that I just like use like the whole area and then after that I'll just treat the whole tank and then you can just sort of sit back and that should sort it out. Now a lot of people advocate lots of water changes I mean that's not really my style of fish keeping I don't want to just keep chucking water at something to try and fix a problem for me that's not really an ecosystem then that's just constantly flushing stuff through. Now I know like in a river it's constantly flushed flush through I'm not in a river I'm in a room above a gym that's playing loud music. <laughs> So let's do a complete rundown as if you're building a tank from the ground up. We start off with that really good nutrient substrate layout. We need good nutrients so that the plants can grow really fast and healthy. They will pull nutrients from the water column, but they need it from the roots as well. That's not true, they don't need it, but if they have it, you're at a way better advantage. So you've got your nutrients in, you've locked it down as well, because in these low tech systems, you probably don't want it floating around in the water column, because we're not doing like constant water changes. It's locked down with a sand layer on the top or a gravel layer on the top, and now we can get into our plants and put the plants in. Now the plants we want to use, remember, are fast growing ones, at least initially, as well as you can have some Anubias and Java ferns as well, which aren't really fast growing. Um, but you know, the majority of your, your makeup of your tank wants to be these fast growing stem plants. Remember we said, get five if you can, five different stems, put them in and see which ones grow, uh, grow really well for your water parameters. Everyone everywhere has got slightly different like parameters and you might just find that this plant does not work for me. There's, like I said, there's a few on my list that I just don't go near unless I was to do like RO water, CO2, and no, that's not worth it for me. Right, you've got your substrate in, you've got your plants in, you filled it up with water. Next up is the lighting. You can go for whatever lighting you want, but you need to pay attention to the plants in the first sort of week or so, and there needs to be showing signs of growth at the top. The top part of the plant should look a slightly different color to the uh, bottom part because it was grown out of water, and now you've got the top part growing in water. It looks a little bit different, should look a little bit more vibrant and green as well. If you're anything like me, when I first set up my tanks, I used to like every two hours go over peer into the tank like thinking come on grow faster I'm a little bit more patient now but uh, not much more <laughs> so there you go your plants are now growing but it feels like there's a little bit of algae forming on everything not too much but you know more than you'd like it might be time to dial back the amount of time you've got a light on for or it might be a good idea to raise the light again this is where you guys will have to experiment yourself and you learn this over time as to what is the right lighting I can look at a tank pretty much now and know that if there's too much light or not just because I'm so used to it and as I look around my room here 
all of them have pretty much a similar level of luminosity coming out, I don't know why I did that, coming out of the tank. So they're all about level and that's why they're all sort of doing well. That comes down to experience and you're gonna to have to learn that on your own what is the right amount of light for your style of tanks. I say your style, remember, because if you're doing high tech, you can blast it with light, loads of CO2, water changes, tons of nutrients going in in the forms of fertilizer, you get root tabs left, right and center. I mean, that sounds awesome, doesn't it? Oh, a lot of work though. So much work, I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> okay, now you're off to the shop to get your first fish that you already planned for this tank. Remember, go there, don't get all of them. So say you wanted a school of 30 neons, for instance, yeah? Don't go and get 30 neons and put them in your tank because they'll probably die. Go and get five. Put five in the tank and then just watch as the tank evolves. You need to pay attention to the water parameters every single day, at least for the first few weeks. And change that water regularly when it's needed. I would change it regardless, if, it, if even if there's no ammonia showing or nitrite, which there probably will be, um, even just a small amount. And remember, it's not going to be harmful to the, to the fish inside, but it will be food for the algae. So just keep changing it every day, just to start with, because like I say, we don't want to be doing that in the rest of our fish keeping lives, because wow, nobody got time for that. <laughs> right, now two weeks have passed since you've got those first five fish you can go back and add some more to it and you can add a cleanup crew because now by this point it would probably be needed you've built up a level of diatoms background algae that kind of thing so we can put in some snails some shrimps some bristle nose whatever's appropriate for your tank they all work and they all work really well if you've got them in your tank currently they're not working well then it there's too much algae being produced, so you've probably got too high lighting on nutrients or both. So yeah, that pretty much is it in a simplified nutshell. After about two or three weeks, you're going to start to notice that some areas get more algae than others. Maybe it's due to flow, that kind of thing. Now, manually remove that, and you can spot treat certain areas as well with like a CO2 booster I use from API, but there's, there's lots of glutaraldehydes out there. I just really like API's products, plus they sponsor the channel, of course. This is not a sponsored video, I'm just saying that. <laughs> and you should find out this three week, four week point that the, the tank is looking absolutely lush and really, really nice. You should have been able to sort out any problems by then in terms of algae, by sorting out your lighting or the cleanup crew and manual removal. And we should be able to stop at this point doing many water changes. Now it's up to you what you want to do. I like to go as minimal as possible. Some tanks I just, eventually I just stop doing water changes. I just top them up with water. And whenever I do a water top up, that's when I add my fertilizers, which usually about once a week. It can be every once every one week and a half. It just depends on how hot everything is and how fast the evaporation is for me. But there's something massively satisfying about getting a tank to a point where it's just running smoothly and perfectly. If it was my home aquariums, I'd just keep that going indefinitely. Um, but obviously this is my studio and in the studio you create content, so stuff gets broken down new things are built. But hopefully there's been some really helpful information in this video for you guys and if there has, do me a favour, maybe click the subscribe button and a little like and a little notification bell, something like that. You don't have to, but it would be great if you could. And then hopefully I'll see you on the next one.